Oh, I used to be King James only, but now that's the title of this video. And what I want to talk about today is people who came out in support for the King James Bible and then they turn on the King James Bible. Why do they do that? Okay, I'm not backing off on the King James Bible issue. You can rest, <laughs> breathe easy, let your heart rate go back down. Uh, that's not going to happen. By the grace of God, I'll never, ever back off on the King James Bible in the defense of it. But there are a lot of people, and I've seen the videos time and time again, oh, I used to be King James only, but then, but now, you know, I've come to my senses, I'm not part of the cult anymore, or something ridiculous. And I'm going to show you why people back off on standing for God's holy word. Okay? I'm going to show you about that, and I'm going to show you that, in fact, I'm actually not King James only. I'm what's called a King James Bible believer. There are a lot of people that only use a King James Bible, but they don't believe it. I'm going to show you the difference in this video. Okay, here's what happens. People out there that are saved and whatever else, eventually you'll run into some kind of, you know, King James only material. And you will see the fact that a book like this, a perversion like this, the NIV, actually does remove verses. And that there are major doctrinal changes between the King James Bible and the NIV. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. He appeared in the body. Obviously, the King James Bible is a superior reading. And if you dispute that, well, you have some problems. Okay? And there are many, many more, which we could, I mean, it... You can go down through the list. Acts 8.37 is in here. It's not in there. And you say, what's in the footnotes? It doesn't belong in the footnotes. It belongs in the text. But what happens is people see it and they say, oh, that is bad. I guess I should become King James only. And so, which is okay, but then the problem is they stand for the King James Bible and they make a public dec declaration about it and the people who have been trained against the King James Bible, they start to throw attacks at that person, and the person can't answer it. They say, well, I, I don't know, you know, and, and they, they get all these attacks and stuff, some of which I'm going to go over today, and they don't know how to answer. And then comes the second thing, they begin to be mocked for being King James only. Oh, you're part of that cult. You're a Ruckmanite or some other name like that that they come up with. You're a church splitter. You're divisive. You're, you know, and they, they begin to be mocked. And after that, they will quit. And oftentimes they'll turn and actually go against the King James Bible. And I've seen that happen time and time again. Okay, and I'm going to show you some, that's what I want to discuss in this video. Uh, now it's, as I said just a little bit ago, I am not actually King James only. Uh, the weird fact of the matter is I actually have more new versions in my collection here and look at them and read them and everything else. You know, I actually have more of those than most modern Christians do. As a matter of fact, I'm going to see if I can do a little trick here and show you all my new versions. You ready? Wow. So here they are. And this isn't the whole collection either, by the way. I still have some over here and some up there, up top and everything. You know, this isn't all of them that I have. But these are all non-King James Bibles. Okay, I mean, I have all kinds of stuff. I even have some of these wicked modern paraphrases like this uh, Rob Lacey's Word on the Street. Which is just, it's disgusting. I can't even read it without feeling sick. Uh, the Amplified Bible, God's Word to the Nations. Didn't want to put that on top. The Green Bible, Reformation Study NIV, really disgusting. Berkeley Version, Confraternity Version, Living Letters, J.B. Phillips Translation, Simple English Bible, New Living Translation, this wicked uh, Illuminati Bible, Bible Illuminated. I've done things on this. It's just a, one of the most disgusting things you'd ever want to... Uh, it's vexing to even touch the thing. Good news for modern man. 
I have a whole, let me get them here, a whole bunch of uh, these wicked new Bible zines. Uh, I even have a, the official four part uh, original reprint Roman Catholic certified uh, 1610 Dewey Reams. You know, most Catholics don't even have this thing. And there it is. This thing was really, really expensive, you know. <laughs> But that's what I do. I'm a researcher. You know, I spend money on materials like that. So, there you go. Now I need to get rid of this mess. Let me try it again. Wow. Just like that, they're all going up. Oh, two left. These didn't disappear for me. Here we have a original 1881 revised version. And here we have a second edition American Standard Version of 1901. So, take care of those. But uh, continuing here, I'm not King James only, you see. I have a lot of the versions, almost every one that's been in print actually, I have most of them in my collection. I'm not afraid of them, okay? I'm not some kind of a cult leader or cult follower or something that I shun everything. No, I'm not afraid of the other materials, okay? So what am I? I'm a King James Bible believer. It just simply means I believe in the King James Bible. I believe it's God's perfect word. That's what I believe. But now I want to look at the three main attacks that a King James Bible believer will receive. Okay, the first of these attacks on the King James Bible will be variant Greek readings. Okay, people usually don't bring up Hebrew very much. It's usually a, the fight is mostly over the New Testament, the Greek of the New Testament. Uh, the second attack that you're going to get is attacks on the men involved with the King James Bible. We'll look at that one in just a little bit. The third one, of course, will be attacks on King James Bible believers themselves and on those who defend the King James Bible. Now, let's look at those three areas. Okay, the first of the three areas is uh, tax on the King James Bible with variant Greek readings. And they come in a couple different uh, ways that they go about this. First of all, they'll say, well, the King James Bible translates it this way, but actually the Greek says this. Now, what they will do is, to the new believer in the King James Bible, the, deceive, the, the deceitful Alexandrian cultist will come out and they'll say the Greek says this or the Greek says that thereby deceiving the new believer into thinking that there's only one Greek text there are many Greek texts okay here are the two most popular the Nestle's 27th and this one put out by the Trinitarian Bible Society this is supposed to be a Textus Receptus not exactly the same as what was used by the King James Bible translators but comes close. But the fact is, there are many more, but here are the two main ones. Two different Greek texts. Now what you can do is, this one is put out by the Vatican. Okay, this is a corrupt Greek text based on a very small minority of Greek manuscripts. And they keep finding more and more Greek manuscripts and it lines up over here with the Receptus type manuscripts. Here are the numbers you can see where it's at right now currently. I mean, this thing doesn't have anywhere near the kind of support that the Textus Receptus does. But they'll lead you to believe that this is the best text. They'll lie to the new believer. And what they'll do is, they'll say, well, actually, the Greek word there is such and such, and the King James mistranslates it. And they'll read out of here. They'll take readings out of the corrupt text and correct the King James Bible with it. And they'll never tell them we're using a different Greek text than what was used behind or for the King James Bible. That's how they deceive. Okay? And, of course, there's also variant uh, texts there with the Hebrew as well, which I'm not going to get into. And it's funny because after you pin them down that there are many Hebrew and Greek texts, they will try to, or tr try to defend this text over here. And again... I didn't even have one of these things until a few years ago, 
but I was told, oh, the Nestle's text, oh, that's the one, you know, the Alexandrian, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, they're the best, you know, and Alexandrinus and all this other stuff, you know, they're the oldest and best manuscripts. They don't, you know, contain these verses that the King James Bible has in it. They deceive you, okay? Those manuscripts are corrupt, and they've been rejected by Bible believers for centuries. You know, it's just incredible. And they will never tell you that this thing's put out not only by the Vatican, made under the supervision of the Vatican, says it says so right in the forward, I have it in other videos, but also a Jesuit cardinal, Carlo Maria Martini is his name, he's on the board that puts this thing out. A Jesuit. You know, they don't tell you that stuff though. So that's one of the attacks that they will use. The Another attack that will be used to um, discourage the new believer in the King James Bible is Westcott and Hort's theory of conflation. Okay, uh, this basically is this this thing they come out and they say, well, the NIV, yeah, it, it doesn't have some of the verses that the King James Bible does, but that's because of the this is a conflated text. The King James is a conflated text. In other words, there were verses, the verses that the new versions take out and the words that they take out were actually added to the King James Bible. Okay, that's what the theory of conflation is. And basically, West Cotton Hort, over a hundred years ago, they came up with a theory called the Lucian Recension. And this was basically that there was a meeting, a council, after the Bible was completed, and that these men thought that some verses should be added to the New Testament manuscripts and some words to make things clear. And that that, you know, added to text is what came down through the Receptus line and now appears in the King James Bible. Just one big problem with that theory. You know how much evidence is behind it? Nothing. Zero. Westcott and Hort never produced any real proof that there was ever this Lucian recension. Okay, this is not a conflated text. But it's interesting because this theory that they came up with was actually answered by one of the greatest scholars of the uh, 19th and then early 20th centuries, Dean John William Bergen. He was a dean of uh, university there in Chichester, I think it was. He answered Westcott and Hort. And yet the theory of conflation, their theory of conflation, is still taught today. Which is very interesting because it's very similar to evolution. You see, back in the 1870s, I believe it was, there was a professor and he came up with the theory of embryology. Ernst Haeckel, I think his name was. And he came up with this thing, he called it, big words coming up, Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In other words, the development of the embryo shows how we evolved from goo, you know, and it was proved to be a fraud. And yet there are still evolution professors today that are teaching embryology. Okay, and that's a good way to justify abortion too. That it's just the fetus in there and it's just a, it's not really a, a human, it's not really a little boy or a little girl. It's just this tissue, you know, and you can kill it if you want to, if you don't want to take the responsibilities for your actions of getting to be with child as a woman. But that was proved to be a fraud over a hundred years ago, and it's still taught today, just like West Cotton Hort. Hmm. And it's interesting, too, because the new version philosophy of they get better and better and better with time, what philosophy is that? It's evolution. Same thing, exactly. Same kind of a philosophy that the new versions are getting better. When the Bible says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. You know, it, it goes on and on. The King James Bible says that there would be a falling away in the end times. Not a spiritual renewal, a spiritual revival. That's nonsense. The third attack with variant Greek readings is uniform translation. Okay, this is another one of the tricks of the Alexandrian 
perverts, uh, perversion people, and I don't mean sex perverts, you can pervert scripture as well, but uh, they insist that a Greek or a Hebrew word must be translated the same way every time. That is a total lie. That's not a good way to translate anything. And there are no versions out there that translate the same word the same way every single time. Okay, unless it's like a proper name or something. The point is, they will use that and they will say, I'll give you a good example, Acts chapter 12, verse 4, probably the most popular of all of them. They say, the Greek word Pascha must always be translated Passover. Total lie. The Greek word Pascha can be translated as Passover or Easter. And the translation of that word is dependent on the context in which it appears. Okay? These people, oh, you know, Easter is a false translation. Really? Let me ask you a question, you out there that believe that. What is the Greek word for Easter? And why is it that Greek Orthodox churches, when it comes time for Easter season, they talk about Pascha? They'll say it's Pascha Sunday. I mean, why are they saying that? Because their word for Easter is Pascha. It's not a mistranslation, but people will bring that up and they will use it. And it's just, I mean, it's been answered so many times, it's, it's just sickening that people bring it up anymore. But the Alexandrian perverts will come along and they will use it on the, on the new believer in the King James Bible and they'll say, see, the King James Bible, while it's been good and, and you know, kind of there for the ignorant people for the last 400 years, it's no longer good today. You know, we've proved now with our modern scholarship that it's not actually accurate to the Greek text. That's how they'll lie to you. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And something else I want to just say, and that is, it's, it never ceases to amuse me that you get these people on YouTube, men and women, whoever, and somehow now, because they have a Nestle's text or some kind of a lexicon or some computer program, they're now more intelligent and more qualified to translate Greek and Hebrew than 54 of the greatest scholars that ever lived that took seven years to make the King James Bible. Do you see a problem with that? These great men that lived back in a time that knew nothing about pornography or methamphetamines or any of the other stuff that's out there today, I mean, vexing, you know, television, Hollywood, all the other rock and roll music and all this other garbage, and those men lived in a pure time back then, it wasn't sinless, they still had problems in 1604 to 1611, but their minds weren't defiled like ours are today. Not at all. I mean, the Bible talks about Lot being vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. From day to day, you know, he was being vexed. And it certainly is vexing to live today. But those men lived in a time of moral purity back then. You know? And they were brilliant. I mean, study the lives of the King James Bible translators. They were incredibly intelligent men. Okay? 54 of them. But yet some person comes along today, man or woman, and they go through their little university education, you know, for maybe six years, maybe seven years, you know, and they have their little Greek text, and they're able to tell you the mistakes that the, the King James translators made. Yeah, right, uh-huh. Okay, attack number two that uh, a new King James Bible believer will face is attacks on the men involved in the King James Bible translation. Okay, and one of the favorites of the Alexandrian perverts is that King James was a sodomite. Or, to use modern terms, which I don't agree with, is homosexual or gay. Okay, King James was not a sodomite. Alright, that is ridiculous. And in fact, those attacks on King James were brought out 20 years after his death. Okay, the guy was married and he had eight children. He was not a sodomite. And he also wrote against sodomy. And back then in 1611, if you were guilty of sodomy, they put you to death. 
Okay, it was instant execution. King James was not a sodomite by any means. And even if he was, which he wasn't, but even if he was, what does that have to do with the King James Bible? Nothing. King James didn't do anything but authorize the translation and offer his royal protection for the translators so that they, get, so that they could get the work done. Okay, it's just an absurd accusation. And by the way, let me just get this real quick here. If you want the whole story on it, you can get this book here, King James Unjustly Accused by uh, Stephen A. Coston Sr. There you go. Right there. It's been debunked time and time again, just like the Acts 12.4 thing, but they just keep on bringing the attacks out, the same old worn out attacks, hoping that the new believer doesn't know how to answer them. So then they can destroy their faith in the King James Bible and get them to turn and say, well, I used to be King James only, you know, but now I'm not. That's what they do. Okay, attack number two that you're going to get. They'll say Erasmus was a Catholic. You know, oh, oh so then this is somehow destroys the text that underlies the King James Bible the you know, Texas Receptus and, and thereby it taints the King James Bible and the King James Bible is somehow now a Catholic translation. You know, it, I mean, just absolutely absurd. Just ridiculous. Let me make a couple points here. Was Erasmus a Catholic? Yeah, he was. Oh, no, then his text that he made up out of thin air must have been a Catholic text. Okay, first of all, Erasmus only compiled manuscripts and made and put them together to make a text. Okay, when they find Greek manuscripts, they aren't like this. They aren't whole manuscripts, whole copies of the New Testament. It's a page or a couple pages or maybe a book or a chapter or two. And Erasmus took and he took Textus Receptus manuscripts and he put them together and made a Greek with Latin beside it uh, text. And he made it a couple different editions. Okay, he didn't make it up out of thin air. He just compiled it. So, first of all, it's kind of ridiculous to say that his Catholic beliefs somehow made him part of it. Secondly, Erasmus was condemned basically as a heretic. He did not follow the teachings of Rome. In fact, he was quite critical of the Roman Catholic Church back then. Okay. And I even heard that he was buried in a Protestant seminary. They wouldn't even bury him in a Catholic church. The third point. Could you please show me one Catholic translation which comes from the Textus Receptus? If Erasmus was this great Catholic and he dedicated his text to the Pope and all this other stuff, which is true, why didn't the Catholic Church ever use it? Why isn't there the Dewey Reams version using the text of Erasmus. They didn't. They used Jerome. Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Okay, they used the corrupt Alexandrian text. That's what they use today. They use the Nestle's text. It's put out under the supervision of the Vatican. So, again, there's no argument there. And by the way, another thing here I want to make a point of the translators of the King James Bible did not use Erasmus' text as the basis for their translation. So again, it's not even, it's, they use Stephan's uh, one text. It's not even an a argument to say anything at all about Erasmus. Again, a very weak argument brought out by the new Alexandrian, new Bible version perverts, basically. Just another lie that these people put together. Okay, another thing that they'll say is that the King James translators had limited knowledge and resources to make their translation. And now we have, you know, so many more manuscripts. Again, another lie. The King James translators had everything available to them that translators do today. If they found a couple more manuscripts, they don't say anything different than what was available back in 1610 or 1604 to 1611, 1610, the Dewey Reims Bible came out, the Catholic translation, the Jesuit translation, and many of those readings appear in your modern versions. I have a video on that. You know, 
the stu these readings were available in 1611 and they rejected them. They knew that they were corrupt. Okay, they don't have anything today that was not available back then in 1604 to 1611. Okay, attack number three that you're going to hear from the New Version crowd. And that is that King James Bible believers are militant and divisive and church splitters. Uh, well, I'd like to point out very simply here that uh, the New Version people are too. Okay, there are some very militant King James Bible believers out there that are, you know, sometimes lose a little bit of grace. Sometimes they let their flesh take over and really slam somebody hard and call them all kinds of names. It's hard not to sometimes, some of these people. But the reality of it is, that happens on both sides. Okay, I've been called some pretty foul things uh, down through the years by defenders of the new versions. So, it's not really an argument. I mean, be a man, okay? Take a little bit of names now and then. No big deal. Give me a break. Point number two that I'd like to bring up here. They say about divisive and church splitters. Well, I can tell you as a fact that I know of a number of old-time King James Bible churches that were split up because some young kid that just got out of seminary and had his mind warped by Alexandrian philosophy, he comes in there and the people use the King James Bible and believe it, and this kid comes in and destroys the church, and a lot of people leave. Oh, but that's not division. That's just old people that aren't willing to change, you know, traditional Christians. No, it is division. And it's true division. Okay? And, of course, there are other things, too, that divide churches, like the modern rock music and everything else, the contemporary Christian, you know, Christian music, which it's not Christian. But I know personally of situations where the elderly actually had to leave because of the loud rock music and the new versions that were brought in. Okay, so don't, again, don't give me this, this stuff that only King James Bible believers divide churches and split churches. That's a lie. The new versions are the ones that are doing it. Many, many more times, the new versions are dividing churches and dividing Christians. Okay? But do King James Bible believers really bring division? Now think about that. I showed earlier all those new versions. Now, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. Now, if you have people with a hundred different new versions, does that bring unity or confusion? It brings confusion. You see, when you are King James only or a King James Bible believer, it brings unity. When everybody in the church is using the same Bible, quoting out of it, reading out of it, when your standards are based on the same book, it brings unity. I want to see Christians united under one Bible. I'm not bringing division. Okay, I'm, I'll bring division when it comes to truth versus error. Sure, I divide from people that will not accept the King James Bible. I don't want anything to do with them. Okay, but I want unity. That's what I want, based on one book, and that's the only way it can happen. Another point I want to make, you have to watch out for a lot of the modern day vocabulary. Uh, words have, they say about words have changed meanings. Yeah, that's awfully true. And you don't go back and change the Bible, you know, when it comes to a King James Bible word that has been perverted by modern culture. But I want to talk about another type of word changing meaning. And that is that many times our modern day words that we use and people think, you know, things in their heads based on certain words, they really need to go back to the King James Bible and see what it actually means. I'll give you a good example, the word church. Now when I say church, most people think in their minds of a building with a steeple on top and a, and a sign out by the road telling, you know, First Baptist Church of wherever. That's not a church. That's a building. The church is the group of people, the body of Christ. That's the church. The building is just a, a meeting place where you go to. Okay, that's not a church. And a lot of people, when they think of a church being divided, they're thinking of that corporation building, the business, you know, with the, the pastor as the CEO and the 
board of directors as the elders or the deacons. You know, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay, the church is the people, not the building. And what happens is, when you come in and you say the King James Bible is the truth and you got one of these new version pastors and he's not going to change, what happens is then families leave and then the income drops and then they can't pay their bills, which they shouldn't have had in the first place, and then their church building starts to have financial problems and then they say, oh, these King James only people, oh, you know, they, they split the church. No, the truth came in and that group of people meeting in the building, they didn't like the truth, and so they wouldn't submit to the King James Bible, and so the Bible believers left. That's not a bad thing, okay? That's a good thing. And I'm going to tell you right now, you need to leave. If you are in a church and they're using the new versions, which come from the Vatican, and they're not willing to change to use the King James Bible, I'd get out of that place. Don't even, you know, give it a second thought. It's bad news. But what about this spirit of division thing? Oh, a division, division. Let's look here at some scriptures. Luke chapter 12, verses 51 through 53. Here you have Jesus Christ speaking, and he says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, Three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus Christ brought division. And he said he's going to bring division. So it's not the thing of a spirit of division, you know, which is condemned in the Bible, where you actually have somebody coming in and saying, I want to break these people up. That's not what a real King James Bible believer does. We come in and we say, here's the truth. I hope it doesn't split everybody up. I'd like to see everybody be converted to the King James Bible. But if not, I have to separate from you. That's not a spirit of division. Here's your spirit of division right there. The new versions. Because the new versions are coming in and saying, we don't want unity based on one Bible. We want this unity. We want confusion based on multiple Bible versions. So when there's responsive reading, it can't be done. You can't have responsive reading in the average church anymore. Why? Because they're all using different Bibles. And how does it look to the lost world? The lost world blasphemes God's Word now because of all the multiple new versions. They make a mockery of Christianity. You know. They'll say, oh, I, the Bible says, oh, which one? And they're right. They're right to say that. They're absolutely right. It's a very ridiculous religion that has multiple contradictory holy books. Think about it. Okay, again, King James Bible believers are not the ones bringing a spirit of confusion and a spirit of division. We want unity. But standing for the truth, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Standing for the truth will bring division. Just as simple as that. But look here at Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. There you have your new version perverts, the Alexandrians. By good words and fair speeches, not the words of the King James Bible. They won't quote scripture as their final authority. They'll talk about feelings and attitudes and qualifications for ministry, but they won't rely on the written words of God. That's what they'll do, okay? And they'll talk about divisions and everything else. And their divisions are over feelings and the nice little stuff and everything. It's not over Bible doctrine. And these new versions mess up Bible doctrine. They cause divisions over doctrine. And we should mark them which bring these new versions and avoid them, according to the Bible. And as I said earlier, if you leave a modern or if you are in a modern church, 
and the pastor there refuses to submit to the King James Bible, leave. Don't waste your time there. You are not in a legitimate church when a pastor is not willing to obey this book right here. You're not in a legitimate church. You are in a false church with a false spirit there. The guy might be saved. There are, there are new version people out there that I think are saved. Think. But the fact is, they're not walking with the Lord. God is not behind this stuff over here. Look at the source. It goes back to there. Back to the Roman Catholic Church that slaughtered tens of millions of Christians down through the centuries. This is not where your Bible comes from, folks. Okay, another reason why you have people that say, I used to be King James only, but now I'm not, is because persecution arises because of the Word. I talked about that earlier. Let's look at some scriptures here. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 and 21 says, But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the Word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a little or for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Isn't that something? When persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. Now why would you be offended at the written word of God? Well, let's look. John chapter 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, what's the thing about the word there? Look down at verse 17, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You are sanctified. You are set apart by the written word of God. That's how you know things. That's how you're able to discern things and see things because you have a written authority in the King James Bible. Now, Satan's favorite thing to do is to come along and take this book away from you because as soon as you take this book out of the hands of a Christian, you can be deceived very easily. And I mean, study the cults of like Jim Jones and some of these others. What they do is they'll take the Word of God away from the people. They don't encourage you to read the written Word of God for yourself. And for centuries and centuries and centuries, the Catholic Church, when they had control of Europe, they did not give their people the written Word of God. Most of the people in the Dark Ages couldn't even read. And they depended on their priest to tell them what the Bible said. That's not a good system. Okay? It's not of the Lord. Another question. Do you really love Jesus? So, well, of course I love Jesus. That doesn't affect me, you know, me using the word. Look at John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, not only do I believe that you should keep God's word as far as being preserved, but you should keep what's written in there. You know, about marking them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Things like that. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You know, there's a lot of things that are written in this book which you have to ignore if you want to defend the new versions. And don't tell me you love Jesus Christ and hate the King James Bible. I don't think so. Not going to happen. Now, another point I want to make as far as this thing about loving the King James Bible, loving Jesus and loving His Word, and that is if somebody would attack someone that you love personally, a husband or a wife or parents or children or whatever, wouldn't you want to investigate before you just write them off? I mean, if you're a man and you have a wife that you love very much, or you're a woman and you have a husband that you love very much, and somebody comes and they say, I saw your husband or your wife or whatever, I saw them cheating on you. Would you just say, that's it, I'm, I'm going to apply for a divorce. I'm quitting. No. You would want to investigate the matter. And so should it be 
with your King James Bible. Okay, somebody attacks this book. Let me tell you something. I've heard a lot of attacks on this book down through the years, and I have never seen one attack that there's not an answer for. I've never seen one. Now, it takes work and study to answer the critics of the King James Bible. There again, that's another reason why a lot of people quit on the King James Bible because of the massive amount of work that goes into studying this issue. I mean, it's a huge issue. And it takes a long time to do it, a long time to study, a lot of reading, a lot of, you know, there's a lot to it. But I have never seen one attack that has not been answered. And there, you know, the con supposed contradictions, I've never seen one that's not answered. The attacks on King James and the attacks on the translators and Erasmus and Acts 12.4 and all these other places where they attack the King James Bible, it's all been answered. The answers are out there for you they are available to you okay and there are many good king james bible believing websites out there that provide answers to all your different questions to all the attacks that you will hear on the king james bible now it takes work you have to go to those websites and you have to look up this information okay chick.com they have a great section on answering the critics of the king james bible and they have many of the common attacks that you're going to hear, and they're answered in a very easy to understand manner. They have Sam Gipp's book, The Answer Book, which is one of the very first I've ever read on the issue of the Bible versions. And they have that thing available. But you can read it for free online. Okay, and the interesting thing is, once you meet up with one of these Alexandrian perverts, they will never stop asking you questions because they don't want answers. All they want to do is destroy final authority and destroy your faith in it. That's all they want. They will, as soon as you answer their questions, they say, Erasmus was a Catholic. And you say, yeah, but you know, the stuff that he came out with, the Texas Receptus that he basically started, you know, making the addition there, it was never used by the Catholic Church. He was not a friend of the Catholic Church. You, you answer it, they'll say, oh yeah, well, King James was a sodomite. Well, here's the answers to that. Yeah, well, Acts 12, 4 is a mistranslation. Here's the answer to that. Uh, Peter Ruckman had a bad life before he got saved and even, it, you know, and on and on and on. And they'll just keep question, questions, questions, questions. There's never, there, it's just a never ending thing with them. Okay, why? Well, because they're part of the Yea Hath God Said Society. Satan is the one that always, that's, you know, sin came into the world because of Satan asking questions. Eve questions, you know. So what should you do about that? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 describes these people. Let's read it here. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing, look at this, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse, I've been calling them Alexandrian perverts, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. It's right there. And there's another good attack that's answered right there. They'll say, supposing that gain is godliness, you know, well, if, if this King James Bible stuff is true, then how comes big men like John MacArthur and Chuck Swindle and Charles Stanley and Billy Graham and all these other guys, how comes they support the new versions? Huh? You know, look at how big their ministries are. They wouldn't have gotten that big if they were wrong. Uh, they don't understand. They got that big because they are wrong. I've heard different accounts of people that are King James Bible believing and they were told if you want to make it big, you're going to have to quit on that King James Bible. You're going to have to start using the other versions. You make it big by conforming to this side over here. If you don't do that, you're not going to make it big. Now another good question that you can ask these new version perverts is, 
If the King James Bible is not perfect, then what perfect Bible would you replace it with? It's a good question. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. We're going to see this about this thing of who is really behind this thing of taking away the Word of God. Let's read here. It says, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the Word, lowercase w, it's a written word. And these are they by the wayside where the Word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Hmm. So you mean Satan is the one who's behind taking away the word? And you know, the new version is like, you're taking away the new versions. Yeah, but I replace it with a perfect Bible. The new versions take this away from people and they replace it with nothing. They'll try to say, well, you have to go back to the Greek. But the problem is, the Greek, in the, in the forward of the thing, it says that it's not to be definitive. That this is a work in progress. There are more changes coming up. So this thing, in its own forward, says it's not perfect. So what do you replace it with? Now in conclusion, I just want to hit a couple more points here and then we're done. Okay, don't quit on the King James Bible simply because you can't answer everything from the critics. Okay, remember, the King James Bible was translated by 54 of the world's greatest scholars. I mean, these guys spoke multiple languages. They were writing dictionaries in Persian, the one guy. The another, one of the translators was writing his own devotional books in Greek. You know, they, I remember reading, I should probably do a video on this, but when the, when a book of, of scripture was done, a man would stand up and read it, and many of the translators would sit there and read other uh, language translations, French, German, Spanish, you know, whatever, and they would read along, listening to the guy read in English, and they'd be reading it in another language, translating it in their mind, and if they saw something, they'd say, hey, wait a second, I have, you know, a comment to make here. I mean, I can't even fathom them being, being able to do that. Just amazing. The translators were incredibly intelligent. And the King James Bible led to the most amazing revivals and the greatest period in church history ever. You know, it's been around for 400 years. Most of those new versions I showed earlier, most of them are out of print. And they, they come back years and years later, like the American Standard Version comes out years and years later as the new American Standard Version. You know, they have to re-release it. And it's secular publishers many times that are re-releasing it. Like the NIV, owned by HarperCollins. A full understanding of this issue is going to take many years of study. Okay? There's a lot of attacks on the King James Bible. It's going to take you a while to, to know all of these attacks and to know how the angles are. Okay? Now, if somebody attacks the King James Bible and you just found out about it, you're just starting to stand for it, whatever else. If you hear an attack and you can't answer it and they're pr pressing you for an answer, just simply say, okay, if the King James Bible isn't God's perfect word, what is? And if they say, you have to go back to the original languages, you have to go back to the Greek, say, okay, which Greek text? And if they say the Nestle, say, which of the 27 editions? I'd ask him too, another good question to ask him is, how do you know you're saved if you don't have a perfect standard? These things have I written unto you to believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. How do you know? How do you know you're saved if you can't point to a perfect holy Bible in your own language? How do you know? Crazy. And another thing that you need to be careful of is people say, well, you have to look at both sides of the issue. Show me that in Scripture. Okay? I do not recommend you just going out and reading people who attack the King James Bible. Okay? Because their purpose is to take away the Word of God that was sown in your heart. Don't bother reading them. Don't waste your time on those people. Okay? If they come out and they offer you a perfect replacement, 
Okay, but they never do. Believe me, I've read most of their materials. They don't re offer you a perfect replacement for the King James Bible. They don't. Okay, they try to take you to places and, and things and mess you all up. All right, so what am I? I'm not King James only. Okay, I used to be King James only, but I'm not anymore. I'm a King James Bible believer. All right, and there were other translations down through the centuries, by the way, in other languages and things that God used, but I believe the final perfect Bible for the last days is the one I'm holding right here in my hands. This one. Okay? That's it. And if you're a Christian, you profess to be a Christian, and you want to get anything done for the Lord, this is the stand you're going to have to take. Because otherwise, you're forced into being a hypocrite. You're forced into using a Bible like this wicked thing here, the NIV, and you, you are forced to say before the lost that this is the Word of God. But when in your heart you don't really believe that. See, you're a hypocrite. You're a liar when you stand for these new versions. Think about that. See, a lot of you, you've, you've backed off on the King James Bible because you've had some attacks that you couldn't answer. And you've gone to now using the new versions. But the fact is, you haven't really thought about the philosophy that you've bought into. The satanic philosophy. Where now you are a hypocrite to the lost world. Because you call one book, you say a singular reference, the word of God says, but you use multiple translations. Bad news. Study the issue. Alright? It's going to take you a while. All right? You cannot have fast food Christianity. You can't expect to go in and get yourself a nice little happy meal and understand everything. The true Christian life, true Christian sanctification will take you a lifetime. Take you a lifetime of studying God's holy word, the King James Bible, and the issues surrounding it. Just the way it is. Sorry, Christianity is not just this easy little thing that you can get in five minutes or less. It's a lifetime. So that's it. Thank you for all the nice comments on my channel, all the support, all the people praying for me. I really do appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the enemies too out there that attack me, it keeps me on my toes, and uh, helps me to see many times when the attacks are just personal in nature, helps me to see I'm right and that people can't answer what I'm saying. Not proud, it's just a fact. Okay? It's not, it's not about me, it's not about my qualifications. I present the truth that I've learned, that I've been taught. You can do with that whatever you want. Okay, it's not, you know, my copyrighted truth or something like that. No, it's the Lord's truth. Okay, and I'm just presenting it to people. And I give you the resources to go look stuff up on your own so you can find it out too. Okay, the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul wrote to Timothy, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I've been taught. God's been good to me to get to put me in line with a bunch of good teachers of Scripture, and I want to pass it on to you people out there so that you can pass it on to other people. That's how the thing spreads. Okay, that's how we spread Christianity. That's how we spread the truth by committing what we have learned, what we've been assured of, to other people and not backing down. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening and watching another one of my videos. So that's it.